Oh, yeah, no pressure at all, right? Um, happy International Women's Day, first of all, and also happy Friday. And since it is Friday, there's this thing, um, if you're familiar with the Ruby and Rails community, Aaron Patterson, uh, aka Tenderlove, likes to do something called Friday hugs, which is basically just taking a picture of everyone with their arms wide up. I know we just sat down, but if you all just want to, those of you who want to, I'm not going to force you, want to stand up and basically we'll shout happy Friday and I'll take a picture. On the count of three. One, two, three. Cool. Cool, thank you. As a side note, those of you in this vicinity who don't want me to, uh, who want me to like blur out your faces or something before I post it, come find me after. I totally understand. Cool. So, um, last of the day. I know it's been quite a long and uh, very intense conference, but uh, we've had some really excellent talks. Hopefully, this will. Hopefully, you can stay awake until the end. I promise at the end as well that I will give you the answer to life, the universe, and everything which may or may not be 42, so if you just sit, sit tight, uh, I promise to make it a, as interesting a story as I can uh, make it. So, as I said, it is a story. It's the tale of an experiment that went horribly, horribly wrong because it didn't validate my hypothesis whatsoever, but as, as it goes with science and as it goes with experiments, I did learn a lot of other things along the way. Um, it starts with a few years ago, I was listening to a podcast episode of NPR's How to Do Everything. Uh, the shame about this is actually that they've canceled the podcast, so I can't even find an archive version and post the, of this. But um, that said, I did manage to find this screenshot. Uh, the talk title was Small Talk and Penguins. Um, I admit I totally got pulled in by the penguins part. But the interesting thing was at the very beginning of the episode, they were giving an update about uh, from a couple previous episodes ago where they had started what they called an exclamation point fast. Um, what this was was basically all of their communications written had to exclude the exclamation point. So yeah, they were very excited about this. And if you see any of my tweets, this would be like hell for me. Um, and it turns out that it was actually really, really hard. Um, you had to find, they had to find basically different adjectives to describe. Instead of saying, I'm tired, exclamation mark, you had to say, I'm exhausted, or I'm knackered, or whatever, th th things like that. So I think the, I didn't, again, because I couldn't find the episode, uh, I didn't understand, I didn't really get the meaning behind why they were doing this fast, but I guess it was just, kind of a trying something new for 30 days thing. Um, but in general, fasting or abstinence from something is usually a way for us to be able to better appreciate the thing that we haven't been able, that we aren't able to have for whatever duration of time. And I'm not religious myself, but it's very timely uh, because apparently Christian Lent started like two days ago. So there you go, 40 days of something, uh, of giving up something basically. Anyway, so through all this, my mind started to wander and digress as it usually does. And it gave me an idea. What if I was to try and do a code fast? Is there something that I could give up for 30 days from my daily work and by doing so change the way I code or is there something that I would learn to appreciate a lot more? And as a side note, the reason I picked 30 days was because the original exclamation point fast was for 30 days. And also there's this urban myth that it takes at least 28 days to change a habit or so on, so I figured 30 was a good day. That's a different topic anyways. So as any good scientist does, I must, I, I started my experiment using the scientific method, which I had to look up actually because I'd completely forgotten what the steps were. Uh, I'm sorry to all the actual scientists out there. Uh, anyway, so we start with an observation. This is a statement of fact. This is what is true in this moment when I start my experiment. The observation was, I use Stack Overflow a lot in my daily work. Um, uh, and the, this is the point where I have to make a disclaimer. I am in no way whatsoever affiliated with Stack Overflow. I'm not sponsored by them, uh, but 
if you do work for them and want to endorse me. <laughs> Anyways, total non-affiliation, the reason I picked it, um, I don't know, it was just some tool that I use a lot. Then we have to have a question. This question is basically taking the observation and trying to make sense of it. Why does this do that? Or, you know, why is the sky blue? This is the thing that we want to find an answer to by the end of our experiment. So the question for me was, how will my coding habits change if I give up Stack Overflow for 30 days? Next, we have to have a hypothesis, of course. This is another statement, but it's not a fact yet. It's more of a, by the end of the by the end of your experiment, what do you hope to conclude? My hypothesis was, I won't actually need Stack Overflow all that much. I'll be able to do something else, or use something else. And the prediction is kind of the forecasting the outcome. So what do you think will happen by the end of the experiment? My prediction, based on the hypothesis above, was I'll be able to come up with a different way to code, uh, different ways to code without having to depend on basically a tool that has infinite swaths of knowledge. Finally, the most exciting part, I actually had to run my test, my experiment. First off, root stackoverflow.com and family. There's like Stack Exchange, Super User, et cetera, et cetera. Actually, there's a lot more than I remembered ever being in the Stack Overflow family, but I started off with the main ones. So into my Etsy hosts file, I rooted it to home sweet home 127001. The reason I did this rather than adding a filter to my Google searches was actually because I found out that um, Google used to be allowed to have um, custom filters that you can save as settings. They removed that, who knows why. So even with the minus uh, site stack overflow, um, you have to basically re-enter that every single query. And I knew that I would be tempted, and the whole point of a fast is that you have to remove all sorts of temptation. So I made sure that I couldn't be tempted. Next step was to code. Code for 30 days, code do my normal day job, whatever. Use whatever other resources that I could possibly find, including Google itself, but not this one site. And of course, we had, I had to keep a daily journal of my observations for every single day, because otherwise, how can I possibly remember all of the awful things that happened for the previous month? And then some stuff might happen, and at the end, hopefully I can profit. And of course, like I mentioned, it is really hard not to use exclamation points. Um, so what actually happened in step four here? Uh, here's some excerpts, uh, and I'm censoring myself here. Unfortunately, I'd get really angry by the end of it, you can tell. Uh, so here's just a couple of excerpts. Starting off, already struggling, and uh, by the way, this experiment I ran was a couple years ago, I think the summer of 2017. So I don't even remember half the things that I was doing when I was writing these, but you can kind of get a sense of what I was struggling with. Uh, PostGIS is an extension on Postgres, which allows for geographical data. So I was clearly doing some mapping stuff. I am not a, geogra a geographer, I'm not a mapping expert. This was really difficult, especially in Rails without using a gem. And the Postgres documentation wasn't exactly the best, I guess, eh. but I was surviving. Um, but I was starting to pick up that actually a lot of the search results from Google are from this one website. Go figure. Day two. This was a colleague asking me the question, are you on W3 schools because you can't use Stack Overflow? And surprisingly, the answer was no. Um, I'm not gonna go into the whole uh, issue with like what, uh, whether w W3 schools is a legitimate source or not, but anyways, that was a question. By the middle, by uh, two weeks in, apparently I was getting really frustrated with the Facebook API. Um, and could not figure out for the life of me anything. At this point, I was starting to get a sense of what my conclusions would be. Of course, I didn't want to draw conclusions, uh, I didn't want to jump to them, but I was thinking, you know, this is starting to sound a lot like um, my results will be something around documentation and the importance of keeping your documentation up to date. Um, yeah, apparently, I was getting pretty desperate. 
Uh, the next day, I was so desperate that I was actually trying to use Web Archive to get to Stack Overflow. Um, again, temptation, it happens. Um, and yeah, it's kind of sad when some of the Stack Overflow questions are actually like above the official documentation. If you're familiar with RSpec, they have massive differences between version 2.0 and 3.0, and usually when you get Google search results, you get the old one, which is not what you were looking for. It sucks. Um, SQL joins are actually still really hard. Uh, I still can't remember them for the life of me. Um, but, you know, small victories. I was able to solve a ticket without using Stack Overflow whatsoever, which is good. And I was definitely losing steam here. Already knew that basically I wouldn't be able to find the answer that I needed from Google, so who knows what I ended up doing. Almost the end of the month. I was really tired. I was exhausted. And then this. This was the bane of my existence. <laughs> A GitHub issue where they said they posted the answer on a different website. The issue was for the exact, thi exact thing that they were mentioning. Why would you, why? Uh, anyways, yeah, I was rage flipping tables. Anyways, so by now you're th probably thinking, what the hell does ha this have to do anything with the title of my talk? Well, as it was an experiment, as I mentioned, even if the conclusions that I came to aren't necessarily what I expected, or even close to the hypothesis, we must accept that the empirical evidence given to us is what is empirical, or at least as close to empirical as possible, because this is clearly not a very scientific experiment. So after a long, grueling month of this fasting, I had to make my observations and drop some uh, I had to make the new observations and drop some conclusions. This point forward is where I start to make wild assumptions and outrageous claims, so please take everything with a grain of salt from here on. That said, I mentioned that I had thought coming into the end of this experiment that I was gonna think about, rethink the way uh, I look at documentation and how important it is. But I was giving it a little bit more thought, and I started to realize that while it is very difficult, uh, while documentation is a very difficult problem, um, and there are certain libraries that really should update their documentation, Active Model Serializer, I'm looking at you, it's not always, it's not necessarily related to other difficult problems that we are solving on a day-to-day -day basis. And of course, we are here at SigilConf, so the topic of distributed systems at scale is a very important one. These concepts will probably be familiar, and I am not an expert in distributed systems whatsoever. There are much smarter people out there who have written tons of books and white papers and things. So I'm only gonna touch on a couple of them and relate them back to what I learned from my experiment. And yeah, so the, these characteristics will basically look hopefully very familiar to you. We start off, of course, with fault tolerance. This means that we need to build our systems in such a way that if any one part of the system fails for whatever reason, the entire system doesn't go down with it and it continues to operate even if it has to operate at a slightly degraded state. The term bus factor might sound familiar to some of you as well. It's the hypothetical number of people within an organization or a team with whom lies the critical success of that organization or team, because if they were to get hit by a bus and disappear all of a sudden, they would take irrecoverable knowledge with them and everything would crash and burn, basically. Um, it's a very morbid analogy, I know, but it is what it is. Um, and again, there's many other sources that talk about how to increase your bus factor. Basically, bus factor one means that you have one person on your team or in your organization that if they disappeared, they would take all the knowledge with them and basically you wouldn't be able to do anything. You, had a f you would have to fold your business or just give up at that point. Um, so there's, I'm not gonna talk about uh, how to actually increase your bus factor much here, but there is one thing that I wanted to point out. The risks of having a low bus factor sound very familiar if you think about it. In other words, it is the human version of fault tolerance or lack thereof. If one human fails by whatever level of morbidity pleases you, 
there should be structures in place so that this tragedy doesn't destroy the rest of the organization. Relevant XKCD, of course, because there always is one. The title of this one is Wisdom of the Ancients, and for those unfamiliar, the author always adds um, another punchline into the alt text. I know it's not very accessible friendly, but oh well. Anyways, the one for this says, all long help threads should have a sticky, globally editable post at the top saying, dear people from the future, here's what we figured out so far. Um, and I realize that it's kind of difficult to see from the back, but I'll put the slides up and it has links to the exact comic numbers so you can peruse at your, um, at your leisure later. There's also a forum for XKCD comics, if you're not aware. Um, and again, sorry for the tiny print. Um, this one, not very far down, it says, there's one thing worse than the previous comic, a single follow-up reading just, never mind, I figured it out. No answer, no solution, no nothing. It is so, it's pretty shit, like, let's be honest. But we've, I've probably done it, you may have done it, I don't know, people do it, that's the thing. It's shit, we know it's shit, but we do it anyways. And why do we? Like maybe we just don't have time because we're in the middle of trying to fix this really stupid bug and you don't want to be able to finish it and get out the door and you can't spare just a couple of minutes to put your answer up on starostar.com. Maybe you think that you, know, you came across the solution. It should be trivial for the next person to come along and be able to find the same solution as you. So you, you just don't bother. Or maybe you think that, oh my god, it was such a simple answer. Like, how could I have been so stupid not to see it in the first place? So it doesn't need to be put into text. Like, it should be obvious, basically. But imagine if you were the bus factor of your team. What happens then? Here are some questions that I thought of that hopefully will help you and your teams kind of figure out if your organization is tending towards having a very low bus factor, basically like danger zone. Do you have a go-to person on your team? This doesn't always manifest as a bad thing to begin with, because of course, it's always good having a highly knowledgeable person on your team. It's great when they're also very helpful and friendly. Of course, you know, they're always there to help answer your questions, help you solve problems, helps new people on board or whatever, but it's still a sign. It's, uh, it's still a sign of having a low bus factor or tending towards one. Another thing is, do other people in your organization, within your team and outside of your team, realize that this is the go-to person? Basically, do you understand that there, uh, do, do you and your team understand that there's a lot of implicit knowledge in this one person and maybe you should try and extract a little bit of that before you know, they go off on extended holiday in Bali or something? And most importantly, do you have a plan for when this person disappears off to Bali for a couple of weeks and posting you know, beach photos and stuff while you have to sit away in a deep, dark office? Sometimes as well, it's not always just a person. It can be the tool, such as Stack Overflow. It's a great tool, don't get me wrong, but as my experiment showed, sometimes maybe you don't want to become overly dependent on it either. Like imagine for some reason the data center gods got angry and decided to take out whatever AWS, GCP, Azure, whatever uh, cloud hosting that Stack Overflow is on, again, not related, so I don't know, and just decided to like nuke those racks hosting that website. What are you gonna do? Are you gonna, I mean, it already proved hard enough for me trying not to use this one website, but I digress. Anyways, so when we're also talking about fault tolerance, of course, we talk about CAP theorem, uh, and I call this CAP-ish theorem because it's not quite there. It's not distributed systems, it's distributed knowledge. Anyways, so CAP theorem states that you can have at most two of the three, and you must make this, you must make this decision carefully of which to optimize in order to build your system around that. Uh, I know this is not exactly the same thing as fault tolerance, but for the sake of my argument, 
I'm just gonna put that here because they both have the same last words, right? <laughs> and I can hear like a bunch of butts clenching right now because I'm wrong and you must tell me that I'm wrong right now, but please let's save it for the hallway banter later, I swear, it'll be much easier then. Anyways, so availability, this I don't mean how often can that go-to person on your team check their email while they're on holiday in Bali, because that is very bad. It's very high availability, sure, but they're gonna burn out and that's a whole different topic. Basically, you can't have one or the other when it comes to a low bus factor team. You have to think of both and they go hand in hand. Which leaves us with the last one, which is consistency, but we've already established that we have the first two, so, and the knowledge we have can be consistent, but it's not the most important thing. Um, in our world, consistency isn't the primary goal here. And this is still fine because we still have two of the three, so we're good. There's another thing, um, this is, uh, consistency is not our focus, but at the same time, redundancy is. And there is the 321 rule uh, for backups in data res uh, disaster recovery, not uh, data, well, maybe data recovery too. Basically, it states that you should have three copies of a backup in two different formats. So usually it's like digital uh, hard disk plus tape. Apparently, there are some still some tape copies of backups and stuff. And it is a legitimately good backup source, apparently. Um, and at least one of them must be off-site, so not in the same data center as wherever you are. This obviously is a little bit different now because we are in a cloud world and it's a different story, but it's still a very interesting thing, right? And I don't, I'm not saying that you should follow this rule exactly when it comes to sharing knowledge within your team and organizations, but you know, it's still not a bad idea, actually, and especially if you think about the fact that I mean, even this slide deck, for example, I've uploaded it to the cloud, I have a local copy, I should probably put it into a floppy disk or something too, but, you know. And again, this analogy does fall apart, but this is more, for example, uh, it, like a more uh, analogous example anyways. You can take it and apply it to your teams in whatever way. It can look different for every, different, uh, every single team because, of course, every single team is different. Three teams having two different documents containing the same information, one source control, I don't know, maybe it'll be like three different people have the same knowledge in two different formats, both written in, on paper and online, and one truth, I don't know, I'm kind of running out of ideas. It really doesn't matter as long as you have a redundancy plan in place for the people on your team and the knowledge that they have you know, stored up in here. Then we come to resource sharing. Um, and of course, in the vast space of the interwebs, everyone has access to roughly the same vast knowledge and same vast information, short of it basically if anything is public on the internet, it's accessible by anyone who has an internet connection. Um, I'm not gonna go into censorship and stuff like that. That's a can of worms I don't wanna open. However, it doesn't, it turns out that not everyone has the same skills or abilities in finding relevant information, even when it's publicly available to them. It's hard to determine what is actually relevant to my immediate issues if I don't have the skills of picking it out of the giant sea of information of the internet. Of course, another XKCD. In other words, my Google Foo skills are different from yours, are different from your mother's, your sister's, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this one is, this XKCD comic is titled Tech Support Cheat Sheet. Um, I know that is probably really hard to read from the back there, but um, again, I'll post it up online. Important thing is, the only thing I'm upset about this one is it doesn't have the all important, have you tried turning it off and on again? Oh well. But, it does have this one here, which is Google the name of the program plus a few words related to what you want to do, follow any instructions. Imagine if this piece was basically not shared at all. 
it wouldn't be able, available to anyone, of course, and it'd be absolutely useless. But also, imagine if I didn't know what keywords to put into the query after whatever issue that I'm having. I've seen this a lot, and basically that's where the idea of Google Foo comes in, is like, do you know the magic combination of things that gives you exactly what you need, or do you have to just try, keep typing in new query after query, because obviously we all know that nothing exists past page two of Google search results, right? Um, and also for those wondering, the alt text of this one is, hey Megan, it's your father. How do I print a flowchart? <laughs> Legitimately had that question before. And of course, sadly, we can't always just send people a uh, let me Google that for you link. I hadn't used this in a long time and I, realized, I didn't know that they added all the other search engines. And that's quite nice. Diversity, different sources of knowledge, right? Uh, I mean, maybe if there's a colleague that you really don't like or something, you can send them a really snarky link uh, with to let me Google that for you, but you know, surely you wouldn't do that to your grandmother who just wants to ask you how to print photos from her recent trip to Barcelona or something. That wouldn't be very nice. And probably she might not necessarily understand what to do with that. So we know that we have to increase our bus factor we know that we have to share all the resources that we have. But how we do it and the process we have in place to do so is clearly the hardest part of this problem. How exactly do you distribute knowledge within an organization that is growing very likely? I imagine many of the places that we are currently in are growing and you know, we have new developers joining every time, uh, every day or every week. Most importantly, the teams that we are in are heterogeneous, meaning we're not all the same. We are all different people. We are all unique. So before we, sol we, before we try and solve the problem, of course, we have to make our observations again. We need to assess what our organization looks like, what our distribution of knowledge is. If you were to chart out the knowledge distribution of your team, say each of these circles is a different person and a different piece of knowledge that they have, when you draw out the passage of whatever piece of knowledge between these people, does it look like a spoken wheel model or does it look more like a graph, basically? Taking this, imagine that your organization has magically doubled overnight. I mean, sometimes we dream. When you draw this out, how long would it take for one piece of knowledge to distribute fully across all of the organization? In other words, what is the penetration rate and how quickly does your organization achieve 100% or as close to you know, nine, maybe three, four nines, I don't know. How, do you, uh, how quickly do you get to that point? This is what we're trying to improve but we first need to understand what our baseline is. So I don't have a formula or anything for this because of course it's very difficult to be able to track and trace things like knowledge. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have any tools around that. I mean, maybe you can tap something into your brain. Anyways, once we've figured out what our current state of the world is, here are some other things that we can also ask ourselves in order to get a better sense of where we are. When we share knowledge, do we do it by brain dumps or knowledge dumps? This is basically when someone's like, either has like a huge amount of knowledge around one piece of thing and they go, all right, give me an hour, we'll set up a meeting, I will tell you everything and anything about this one topic and then you'll go away and be all that more knowledgeable. It doesn't always work, sometimes it could be useful, but if you're like me, I can't really contain all that information when it's basically like thrown at me all at once. I need to like take things in small chunks, take time to digest it, process it, you know, um, comprehend it, maybe apply it in order to learn from it. So in other words, brain dumps may be useful, but you can't always do this brain dump and then just like go off and into your corner and continue programming, basically. You could be more interrupt driven, so it's more timely knowledge sharing, so rather than a huge one hour long brain dump with one person giving a presentation to a 
hundreds of people. It could be, you know, one-to-one -one or something. You just go on doing your normal day job and then you go, you could turn to your colleague and ask them a question and then they give you a very short answer, relatively short anyways. It doesn't give you as much background information. It just gets to the point that you need. It, of course, can be a little bit more tiring because the whole idea of having interrupts means that we break our flow during the day. But it's more time, the fact that it is more timely helps, retain, helps the other person retain that knowledge. Basically, if I receive near instant answers to a problem that I'm having, it's going to be much easier for me to log that away and actually remember it later on than if I had heard of this answer during this one plus hour long spiel about whatever different thing and that I hadn't really picked up on as being important because I didn't have a problem that needed, the, like needed an answer when I was sitting there listening to someone. There's another way of knowledge sharing, which is the way, um, through discovery, basically. It's not really scalable, though, which is a problem. Think back to the fact that people don't always have the same capabilities when it comes to Googling for things. So discovery is more of, if you were to give someone information by saying, oh, there's a document or a book with, that, with the information that you're looking for, go find it. If you talk, it's, this is the whole thing of uh, teaching someone to fish, you know, and all that kind of, if you're not, if you haven't taught them how to fish in the first place, how can you expect them to catch a salmon on their first go? I mean, maybe they'll be lucky. And also remember the never mind, figured it out. That's basically that. It's not good. So we know that we need to share our knowledge with everyone, and sharing is caring, of course. And we need to do this to reduce the likelihood of failure due to one person's unexpected disappearance from the face of the earth. What processes can we consider? Independent knowledge sharing. Let the people share how they share knowledge best. Let them do brain dumps if they want to. Let them write a message, you know, write a blog post, leave a code review, something like that. This is also the point where pair programming comes up a lot. However, that may not necessarily work all the time, so keep that in mind. It's not gonna solve all the problems that you have with sharing knowledge amongst each other. If you're from an organization that does exclusively pair programming, all the more power to you. I personally couldn't do it. Different matter. And also I find that um, I personally, I find that I can't do prayer programming for long periods of time because I find that it's not conducive to those like epiphany moments. You know, the classic eureka of Archimedes steps into the bathtub and just taking a soak and then all of a sudden he's like, eureka, I know the answer. Probably couldn't have done that if there was someone in the bathtub with him, but you know, I don't know. <laughs> I can't ask him, so. Another way that we can think about it is mimetic or epidemic theory. Basically, this is, you know, memes get passed around a lot, and so does rumors or gossip. In fact, there's actually a networking protocol called gossip, which uses exactly this theory. Fancy that. Computing theory based on human concept that now we're trying to apply once again to humans. It's like the circle of computing or something. Uh, basically, this is um, mnemonics also fall into this. So this is basically how do I make some piece of information small enough, short enough, sweet enough that it's easy to remember, it's e easily digestible, and then you can just like share this out with as many people as you want, and it'll it'll basically spread on its own like a meme or an epidemic. I don't like to think of it that way, but lastly, we can also codify the knowledge that we have. There's definitely lots of information that we give to people up front, and it makes sense to do so, such as when we're onboarding someone new to the team. You know, there's a lot of, here's a document of everything that we know about how our organization works. Take the next few days to just go off and read everything. It's not, however, a set and forget thing. Basically, you can't just write a document once, give it to every new person that joins your team, because Things will have changed by the next time, uh, by the time the next person joins. 
And unless, of course, you've perfected it, which you probably haven't because we're all human, you'll need to make sure that it's kept up to date. You need to make sure that whatever you codify also has some sort of process to make sure that it remains relevant. So you want to leave it to the machines, and you want, as we do, because you know computers are both our creations and our captors, but that's a whole talk for another day. Despite our best efforts, even the most expensive, fastest, smartest computer AI ML algorithm can't fully deal with the fact that we as humans are squishy, malleable, fickle, temperamental, and most importantly, emotional beings. So when you want to codify some information, you have to set some expectations of what actually is going to be codified. What have you written down in text? Is this going to be the word of God? God's, are these your Ten Commandments? How flexible are they, basically? Are they loose guidelines? Are they loose guidelines, or are they the law, and you must follow the law? Also, most importantly, how clear is it? Is it basically a no batteries required? If I just piece, pick up this piece of information and read it, I fully understand. Don't need clarification. Or is it more of a investigatory? I need to find more information to fully comprehend this piece of um, information. As I mentioned before, how up-to-date the information is is another, is another tricky thing. As we all know, any piece of code left to its own devices falls prey to obsolescence almost instantly, basically. It's not as bad as a car that you buy, but it's pretty much up there. So assuming that you've codified some piece of your information, how up-to-date can you keep it? As a side uh, as, a, as a different way of looking at it is also, how useful is it to the more senior people in your organization, the people who have been around longer? The, basically, do those people repeat the process as if they're coming on as new onboarders, and does it still make sense to them? One, and not only is the fact that you know, we, uh, the information may get out of date really quickly is that the rate at which it is actually updated, again, ensuring that by having your older people on your team repeating the same exercise as new joiners, you can try and improve that, but what is the eventual duration between the last time that they or a new joiner has updated whatever documentation that you have and also do they touch it after they've passed this onboarding period. Worst of all, if you have a hiring fees, does that ever get updated? Who knows? So I've had this question several times before, especially when I mentioned that I was not going to use Stack Overflow for a very long time. Um, what do I do about the copy pastas? In other words, what do we do about cargo cults? This is the wiki definition of cargo cults, um, the ritual inclusion of code or program structures that serve no real purpose. Cargo cult programming is typically symptomatic of a programmer not understanding either a bug they were attempting to solve or the parent solution. It may apply when an unskilled or novice computer programmer or one experience, uh, inexperienced with the problem at hand copies some program code from one place to another with literal or no understanding of how it works or whether it is required in its new position. So what do you do about these? Figure out why. Why are they doing this? Because clearly there's a need for the copy and paste, the control, v, control C and V, that the org and the processes in your org are not addressing. Figure out why they're not using, uh, the, why they feel the need to copy and paste. Then we can make it so that they don't need to. Once that, but you have to obviously figure out why they're doing it in the first place. And there are many, many different reasons why. Top one is probably psychological safety. Do they feel like they have the ability to do the work, make their own mistakes, learn from them, and do what is uniquely their own work and not someone else's? Or do they feel like they have to live up to really unfair expectations? 
remove those pressures if they do have unfair expectations. Whether it's time pressures like deadlines, speed of code, quantity over quality, hopefully almost nobody still does that, you know, the whole lines of code is how productive you are. Or even intelligence pressure, for example, I should know this, but I don't, therefore I am dumb, stupid, useless, et cetera, et cetera. Do those people trying to copy paste think that? And therefore, they try to, you know, trying to get by in an environment where they don't feel safe admitting that they don't know something. If you fix that problem, hopefully, copy paste will dissolve away. And lastly, sauce, sources. Um, as a side confession, I don't understand, I live in London right now, I don't understand the obsession that Brits have with Nando's. I wasn't fond of it, but maybe it's different here. I don't know. Anyways, uh, change my view on that later. Attribute everything, sauce, give the sauce. It's implicitly acknowledging that you don't know this already or there is someone else or that there is information out there that you had to look up as well. You had to tap your amazing skills at Google to be able to find the result. You didn't actually know this off by heart to start with. Or basically the shared knowledge of Stack Overflow, I guess. At any rate, if you make it clear that you don't know anything, hopefully other people will follow suit, basically. The last thing we want is to become ashamed of gaining knowledge. Any knowledge gain is a wonderful thing. We need to celebrate it, no matter how small. After all, knowledge is power. Um, I'm not gonna attribute that one because that is debated, but apparently it's Francis Bacon. Not knowing something basically should not be a source of shame. Um, this is a tweet from Kelly Summers where, um, and I'll try and read it out for the people in the back. Some days I feel like a total hack of a developer because I'm just relying on Stack Overflow and Google, but I just want to get this thing done, and there's very little value in me learning this correctly. But I feel dirty. Is there really shame in searching your way through? I don't think so. I absolutely don't think so. And in fact, the replies to this uh, tweet also don't think so. After all, we all come from a state of not knowing anything. And after a while, we also then come full circle back to realizing that, once again, we really do not know anything. It doesn't mean that we need to give up on learning or sharing knowledge. We shouldn't give in to the fact that knowledge distribution is hard. It's a hard problem to solve. So what do we do? How do we scale the way that we share knowledge with each other? Like many things, including distributed systems, there's not a one-size-fits-all solution to this. Each organization and each team will have to come up with its own methods of scaling their knowledge. However, here's some things that I think that could, could be useful that I've seen work in different places. We may have, um, some of you may have roadmaps for either your product or your development team or things like that. But do you have a knowledge roadmap? Do you know how diff at different points in the future your organization processes are gonna change, what they're gonna look like. Much like road mapping your product or designing a new piece of architecture, this should be done up front, not ad hoc, not post hoc, because it'll be infinitely harder when basically you suddenly realize one morning that, oh, instead of four people on my team, I now have 40, and clearly there's a, not a process in place for them sharing information. Okay, now I need to go fix that. It doesn't work absolutely does not work. It's so much harder trying to move pieces when there's that many more it, like that are just flying around in the air. So make a plan for the next month, next quarter, the next year, maybe decade, I don't know, some, come, uh, maybe you won't be the same place, so that might be a little bit of a stretch goal, but basically don't wing it. Don't think of it as, as secondary. It is just as important as any other roadmap or any other architectural design. Basically, when you look at the knowledge in your team as the team grows, does it look like, I call this the sawtooth of doom, also known as sharks in the water, because apparently there are sharks in South Africa. So finally, I have to come to my conclusions from my experiment. Um, again, very much like a distributed system, I know this was kind of all over the place, but hey, 
we managed to make it almost to the end. I am not saying whatsoever that using st Stack Overflow, Google, Yahoo, Ask Jeeves, whatever is bad, of course. Again, whatever way that we use to share knowledge is good. What I am saying is don't forget that knowledge is just as important as the rest of your distributed computing systems. It's, however, it is prone to the same faults and the same problems and the same issues. If we forget this, if we ever only focus our efforts on building the best and most distributed systems, it won't matter at the end if we can't share that information with anybody else out there. After all, if a tree falls in the woods but nobody is around to hear it, did it actually fall? Who knows? Or I guess a better analogy would be if a server fails in the server room and nobody realizes it, if it doesn't, you know, give a heartbeat. I don't know. The weakest link weakens the entire system. This is the whole weakest link of the chain. Uh, oh, sorry, a chain is only as weak, is as weak as the weakest link in it. So strengthen it. Don't be ashamed to admit fault whatever it is, whether it's with you or with someone else in the team, don't, don't be afraid to admit lack of knowledge. And by both improving yours and others' access to shared knowledge, you can strengthen the entire system. And also, of course, master of Google is very important. Not all sharing is alike. Not everyone learns the same way. So it's important to adapt the way that you distribute your knowledge in similar ways at least two different formats, maybe three, maybe more, whatever works for you. And also just share everything, just share everything. Even if you don't think it's important to share, it's important, like maybe it is to someone else. And it's also important to share small triumphs as well. We always forget the negative things, the small things that, you know, the, we, the small little wins throughout our days. Oh. <laughs> Another conclusion is I do still use Stack Overflow. The moment that I took that website off of my Etsy hosts, it was like, oh, it felt great. But actually, as a side, side effect, um, I mentioned that I, there were some habits that, change, uh, that I was expecting to change. I did have one habit that formed, which was when I went to Google and got search results, I actually started skipping the first 10, and I scrolled all the way down, because I was like, oh, Charlie, those are gonna be Stack Overflow, and because I'd forgotten that I was allowed to go back on. Anyways, even when I use Stack Overflow, I try and share back what I've learned. I share with the rest of my team. There's a great, um, it started as a subreddit called TIL, Today I Learned. Um, my company has a Slack channel called TIL as well. And these can be any random piece of information. It could be technical, it could be not. I think someone posted about um, Google Calendars, which we use, had added a new feature that does out of office, because there was a lot of people who basically like had so many meetings, but they were going through them one by one when they set their holidays, clicking decline, 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 decline. Um, it's like little things like that. And it's helped a lot more with getting that vibe of sharing knowledge, no matter how small. Learning is key, everyone wants to learn. The learning is how we advance ourselves. And it is sharing is caring, of course. One last XKCD, because you can never have too many, and there's quite a lot of them anyways. This is, uh, I think this one is called 10,000, lucky 10,000. And again, sorry for the people in the back. TLDR of it is not everyone knows everything, and, but we sometimes forget that. And basically, he does a bunch of maths to figure out that for any one piece of information, there are roughly about 10,000 people a day who will learn that piece of information brand new in that day. Uh, I think he only uses the US population for this one, but anyways. And the alt text is saying, what kind of idiot doesn't know about the Yellowstone supervolcano is so much more boring than telling someone about the Yellowstone supervolcano for the first time. Basically, when you have the chance to teach someone else who is one of these 10,000, consider yourself even luckier that you are able to do so, that you are able to teach them something, because that's a fantastic thing. This brings us to the end of my experiment, and well, actually, I did promise you that
that I would give you the answer to life, universe, and everything, which is the perfect distributed system. I hope you're ready for the answer. It's not 42. Never mind, figure it out. <laughs> Thank you. Any, any questions? This one over there, one. Hi, um, Chelsea. Thank you for your talk. Um, I have a comment and a question. Uh, my comment would be, I think anyone who hasn't read it should read The Phoenix Project, because a lot of the, I, uh, the topics and stuff you raised here are sort of talked about through an example situation in that book. Um, my question would be, for teams that are very small and stretched quite thin, what would you suggest as like an instant or one of the most effective tools to make sure that you don't have that person that gets hit by a bus and then the, the whole company crashes? That's a very interesting one. Um, I imagine that it's probably a matter of changing your mind, uh, your frame of mind. Basically, I know that it's difficult in small startups where everyone is kind of a jack of all trades and trying to do all like 10 different things at once. But at the end of the day, it's something that your team has to kind of come to an agreement on that maybe we'll take Friday lunch together and we'll talk about different things that we've learned throughout the week. Maybe we'll do brown bag lunches. Maybe we'll go to a conference all together. Hey, um, basically, it has to become a, um, a first class citizen. It's not just a matter of, oh, you deal with the databases, I'll deal with the API. You have to be able to share that knowledge because imagine, again, Overnight, if your team doubled from four to eight, even more, how is that one person going to even then spread that information across all of those other people? So you have to kind of start building as you go along and lay down the groundwork so that you know you don't get side, you know, sidetracked or uh, sorry, you don't get like completely blindsided in the future. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> Hi. Um, on the topic of sharing everything, what do you do when an organization gets to a size where you just sharing things is just too much? There's just this flood of information that no one could possibly sort of ingest all of it. That's kind of like the knowledge dump problem. I can't tell you that I have the answer to this, but it's something that you might consider to break things down and kind of categorize things. It does take a lot of work. It's not instantaneous, it's not going to be overnight, but it's kind of like tidying up your room. If you just do one little piece at a time, so like today I'll pick up my dirty laundry and put them away. Tomorrow I will, you know, clean my desk and move, move all those things. If you do that with all the information that you have, because with a lot of, with a vast amount of knowledge um, or information, I think the key thing is that it's not usually very it's not categorized very well. It's basically like, oh, I'll just throw all of my clothes into my cupboard and close the door and nobody will see it. It looks all nice and clean from the outside, but then you open it up, all tumbles out. So basically, you just have to make sure that you consciously do clean up and categorize and make it easily accessible to everyone. The other problem, um, one problem that I've seen in some places is that a document does exist for something, but it's so old and like so difficult to find. Um, I'll be honest, there are some tools that we use for documents, uh, for writing documents where the search is abysmal. Um, actually, one thing that I have started to do now that I saw um, in that tool, at the top of the document, so think like Google Docs or Office 365 Word documents, someone um, had the great idea of adding an SEO line, search engine optimization, and they added a bunch of keywords. And I started doing that with all the documents that I write now because, I mean, it's fantastic, right? There's whole companies and organizations that like do search engine optimization for marketing purposes, but why don't we do the same thing with our documents? So there's that. Uh, th thanks for the uh, great presentation, uh, and uh, also thanks for all the XKCD cartoons. 
they're a great vector for memetic uh, knowledge. Uh, I mean, I wasn't the only one either, right? Yeah. So. <laughs> Um, I've got a more important question. Um, once you'd redirected uh, all the Stack Exchange sites to your local host, uh, I'm assuming you have a local host web server, were you serving anything in place of Stack Overflow? No, I totally <laughs> should have done that. Basically, um, what, um, when my browser hit, uh, when I went to stackoverflow.com on my browser, it just said error page not found or something very bland. It was very boring. I really should have done that. That's a great idea. Um, you are more than welcome to try the experiment and do that yourself. Please post, po uh, please post pictures of what you end up serving on your local host. Hi. Um, so, uh, great talk, by the way. Thank you. So, regarding the code fasting uh, technique, uh, obviously, sometimes this can take uh, or this can cause a dip in productivity. And Sorry, how could you repeat that? This can sometimes cause a dip in productivity. Mm. So, um, how do you justify that to your manager without getting to trouble? So, this actually comes into the reason why I picked Stack Overflow specifically to fast from. Uh, when I was brainstorming all the different things, someone even mentioned, like, oh, you could quit Google for a month. And I'm like, whoa, 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 I don't want to get fired. I just want to try not doing something for a little bit. Um, I think at the end of the day, though, the interesting thing is I didn't find my productivity had declined by that much because most of the time we're not copy-pasting everything from Stack Overflow. It's the information that we're getting, not the actual pieces of code. So even when I found the answer to something from, or like uh, found the answer to my problem, whatever I was going, uh, dealing with, I still had to write that down into my own code. I had still had to apply that to whatever piece of um, piece of software that I was writing. So at the end of the day, it was like very minimal difference in productivity. I mean, again, there was some small wins as well, you know. There are some great documents out there, I gotta say, Stripe, A plus. One yes. more at the back, and then we'll uh, finish. So thank you for a very informative talk. Um, my question, I don't know if you can give advice about this. Uh, so how do you deal with uh, People in the team that are either they hide the fact that they have certain knowledge to either increase the value or because they're just not, not interested. So I've got two examples. For example, I don't list um, having experience with PHP on my CV because I do not have self-harm tendencies. Um, <laughs> and, then, and, then also, and, and then also you get people that... Um, don't or they don't actively share that, um, what they know because they want to increase the bus factor. They want to have that, um, that that chess piece in their position when they want to negotiate their salary or they want to leave and th they want advantages. How do you deal with those people? Yeah, uh, that's the um, job security um, jerk, as I would like to call it. Unfortunately, that's a different matter altogether than the way that your team shares knowledge, at the end of the day, the emphasis should be on the jerk part, is like, if you're being so selfish with, within a team, you're not really benefiting the rest of the people. You're not being a team player, as everyone likes to call it. So either you have to put processes in place so that these people either have to ship up or shape up, like, sh shape up or ship out. I've definitely had too much whiskey. Um, basically, it should become part of the culture of your team to share knowledge as a default rather than I'm going to become the all-knowing of this one thing and I'm going to become like the principal architect and you know I'll have the highest salary and I'll never be fireable. It's not very nice to work with these kinds of people I'm sure so it's a matter of making the culture of your organization kind of prevent that from happening. If Stack Overflow totally dies tomorrow, what advice will you have for us? Sorry? If Stack Overflow tomorrow totally dies, yep. what advice will you have for the rest of us? Got to figure it out. I've already figured it out. I'm just not going to tell you. <laughs> or, you know, someone from 2003 has figured it out. I bet you it's buried in a very old instance of a PHP BB app somewhere. 
in like page 200 out of some thread or something. Anyways, um, yeah. Who knows? Hopefully, um, Stack Overflow has quite a lot, uh, quite a good uh, distributed system and disaster recovery in place for our sake. Cool. Thank you very much. Just thank Grace.